Bom dia. Boa tarde. Boa noite. Or whatever the case may be. My name is Marcus and I am the host of the Black Brazil Today YouTube channel as well as the blackbrazilToday.com blog where I analyze Brazil from a perspective of race. So tonight is not a continuation of the previous video, but I did mention this in the last video that I said there's, there's going to be a couple more uh, topics that I want to discuss and they're, you know, they're somewhat connected, but, you know, they're, they can stand on their own. They're not directly connected, but you can see how one uh, of these stories is connected to another if you just pay attention to it. So a few days ago, I posted a video where I was talking about uh, actress Alini Borges, and I was talking about you know, the the process of uh, coming to a black identity in Brazil is, is not something that develops equal to what happens in the U.S. in most cases. Brazil spent so long te teaching its people of visible African ancestry to avoid being black that sometimes people get into their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s without realizing all their lives that they were basically seen as black. Um. So the story of the actress Alini Borges that I spoke about, she, in her acceptance speech at this uh, Black Awards show, Black Awards ceremony, she talked a little bit about that, which caused me to dig up some more information about her. And I ended up finding an interview with her where she went a little bit more in depth about how, you know, it's, <laughs> you know, people can say, look, I'm 47, but I've only been black for five years, you know. And she explained this process of which she went through in her self-discovery, you know, being black. And I said, you know, it's always intriguing that it takes people that long to come into accepting a black identity. And then, you know, they go on this thing where they want to talk about everything that has to do with race or black identity or the need for black representation. And then it never fails. You always look at the partner that they have. And, you know, they're always married to a white partner. And again, I have to always say this does not necessarily say, OK, well, you're not as black because you're married to a white partner. I'm just saying it's a trend that I see within the, the black Brazilian community. It's just particularly in entertainment circles. It's like, you know, a lot of a lot of Americans I talk to about this or people who have watched the videos or people who are familiar with the situation in Brazil, they they're all fascinated with this blacker than thou attitude that a lot of black Brazilians will have, but just it, there, there doesn't seem to be a connect between black identity, black representation, uh, some, I don't know, some facets of black power, but then how do you promote all of this and then still have a white partner and thus putting your offspring in a situation where they come out closer to white than you are. In some cases, the child comes out, you know, mixed to the degree that you can't really even tell that they're of African ancestry. And, you know, as I've said for years, for many years, I bought into the idea from black, you know, Afro-Brazilian activists that says any person of mixed race, what they call pardos or mestizos or mulattoes or whatever, any of those people should be just classified as black. And I say there are a lot of Brazilians of black, you know, Afro African descendant Brazilians of mixed race who you can look at them and tell that they are black, but then there are others that are so completely mixed. It's just, it doesn't make sense to try to categorize them as black to me. And this is what I'm starting. My whole view has changed on this. So this is why I've had to say, I believe that the term pardo should be used for those type of people who you honestly just can't look at them and see, you know, okay, this person is primarily black because in a lot of cases you simply can't tell, like what is the criteria for judging? Right. Some people suggest, well, what if they have two black parents? And I'm like, that doesn't always really gel. You can have two black parents and still come out looking racially indefinable. Yeah. You know, I've seen it. I've seen it in Brazil. I've seen it in the United States. Like, I'm sure all of us have seen situations where two black parents give birth to a child that is lighter and more European looking than both of the parents. We've seen that. So what do you do in that scenario? You know, uh, I always look at, I remember some years ago, this uh, professor was arguing that, you know, 
if you're going to say that race doesn't exist, then we have to say by extension that mixed race doesn't exist. You can't have one without the other. Or if you're going to neg negate one, you have to negate the other. You know, I've always asked, I'm like, if you had two people who looked, looked identical, but one was the product of an interracial relationship and the other was the product of two black people, would you say that one of those people is black and the other one is not? Or are both of them mixed? You know, this discussion on race can is ongoing because there's no one simple solution to this whole idea of classification and identity. So anyway, the story I want to discuss today fits totally into what I'm talking about. Um, actress, a popular actress, Juliana Alves, wants her daughter to have a connection with her ancestry. But what do the child and father look like? This is something that I pointed out in the last video. With Black identity politics growing in Brazil, it's like, you know, you have Black people who want to, hey, look, my daughter's Black too, you know. It, she, she, you can't really tell that she's Black, but because I'm Black, she, you know, my daughter is Black also. And sometimes that person, that, that child is so racially ambiguous, it's like, well, do we necessarily want to say every child is Black just because they have one Black parent? I'm saying in a lot of cases, that's true, but in some cases... I can't say every person of mixed race would be identifiable as black. This is, you know, and as you look into this example that I'm about to get into, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So Juliana Alves is something as a person is a, an actress that I've known about for a number of years. And in a recent interview, she made this statement where, you know, she wants her daughter to have some type of connection with her African ancestry. And I'm just, yeah, I understand that, but, when you look at the child, you just have to wonder, should that person really fit into the black category? Because at a certain point, when you accept all mestizos, you know, all persons of mixed race, the ones who look closer to the white to the white phenotype, do you, did, should that person really be classified as black? Because in some ways, if we fight for the acceptance of people with dark skin, and then we put people who are just on the cusp of whiteness and you're going to say that that person is black, too. Then it's kind of like diminishing what you think blackness is supposed to be. You know, I know I've, I've said this before, but. And there's no way I can prove this, but I know for years people I, I remember I, I had this discussion this kind of an argument with this guy on Twitter some years ago. And, you know, this is why I says I'm not going to argue with people on Twitter anymore because it doesn't make sense. You know, you, you, you argue for half an hour or whatever and doesn't get anywhere. This this guy was like arguing to me that Paris Jackson was black, you know, one of the children of, you know, pop star Michael Jackson. And I'm just like, I don't see nothing black about that little girl. You know, so I, I really, you know, I've had problems believing that those three children are actually Michael Jackson's you know, like biologically related to them. I almost feel like, like he adopted those three kids. I don't know. I can't say, you know, I can't prove it, but I'm just saying those kids look, what part of those kids looks black to you? So this is the situation that I'm talking about. Um, and see, people have accused me of being somebody who supports one dropism and I'm just, just not me. I say that if a person is clearly black, whether they're light skinned, they might have green eyes. If you can look in their face through the features and say, okay, I see that this person has African ancestry, then to me, they are black. I'm just saying after, after successive mixes, you know, you got black with white, then you got white with the offspring that's mixed race, then another white mixture with the person who's one fourth black, then another mixture with the person who's one eighth black, a mixture with the person who's one sixteenth black. At what point do you say the offspring is no longer black? That, that's the question for me, because I see a lot of this in Brazil, and this is what I'm saying. Up to a certain degree, I still see people can have mixed race and still look primarily black. But then there are other people who just don't fit into that that category. So let's take a look at what Juliana Alves is talking about when she made this statement, because I want to analyze this real quick. So this is uh, actress Juliana Alves, and this is what her daughter Yolanda looked like, I guess, you know, a little bit after she was born. And so Juliana Alves came to fame some years ago when she became a, uh, a participant on the ever popular Big Brother Brazil series, and she was in the third season. So before I even get into just talking about what she said about her daughter, let's get a, let's, you know, learn a little bit about Juliana Alves 
for viewers who are not familiar with Brazilian celebrities. Um, so this story comes courtesy of Vitoria Floro, the writer of this article. So let's go through this. Um, what, what, what this person is talking about in this piece is that, and it's something that I've noticed, uh, Big Brother Brazil, I think it just came off of like its 23rd season. And what I often notice is that whether a person wins, ends up winning on that program, or they end up getting eliminated, just because they become famous on Big Brother Brazil, it often leads them to situations where they just become rich. People set up businesses, you know, they become artists, they become actress, actor or actresses, you know, they get contracts to do, become the, uh, you could say, promote certain products publicly on billboards and in advertisements. There's a number of ways people make money and become famous just because they were famous for being on Big Brother Brazil. You know, a lot of people parlay this fame into another area, which guarantees, okay, they're on the path to becoming, you know, becoming rich. So, the exit of the participant Luciano from Big Brother 20, Big Brother Brazil 22 provoked the beginning of a debate on the Internet. Is it fair to enter Big Brother Brazil just to become famous inside the house? Again, you know, that's what they call, you know, where the what a reality show is uh, taking place. Some of Luciano's confinement colleagues who are part of the cabin cast are already famous. They did not agree with the dancer and actor's dream of wanting to leverage his career with participation in the program. So you know, they're talking about, well, is this fair for somebody to just come on to the show just to get famous? Okay. But I mean, this happens on Big Brother Brazil all the time. So this is uh, Juliana Alves. She participated in the third season of the show. Nevertheless, post-participation stardom in Big Brother is a very common effect and it has already happened to several participants in the house. Juliana Alves, for example, currently works as an actress at Hedgy Global, you know, Global TV, the global television network, uh, Brazil's most powerful, most powerful uh, television station. And she participates in several of the network's soap operas. At the time, her most recent role was as the character, character had not the Gomez in the seven o'clock soap opera known as Salve Si Quem Puder. OK, this is a scene from another novella that she appeared in. However, the actress became really known due to her participation in the third edition of Big Brother Brazil. Before making her debut on the BBB screens, Juliana studied dance, and after excelling during the classes, her teacher recommended her to a famous choreographer who gave Juliana the opportunity to be a part of the Ballet du Faustin. Now, Faustin, uh, I've talked about this program a number of times uh, on the blog over the years. You know, it's like a Sunday evening variety show where they have musical artists come on. They play little silly games. You know, they started uh, doing this uh, routine that was kind of modeled after Dancing with the Stars. They called it a uh, Danza dos Famosos. Danza dos Famosos. They call it like the Dance of the Famous Ones or whatever. Full Stone used to be, it was a, you know, it was a, a mainstay on global television's Sunday evening uh, lineup. Uh, and I guess it was, a, I don't know, maybe about two years ago, he left the network and he went, went over to another station known as Banji or Banderanches. Um, I remember when I first started reporting on that series, you know, if you live in Brazil for any amount of time, everybody's probably watched that program at one time or another. It's not that I'm a fan of the show. It's just that so many programs you can watch in Brazil, you just get a feel of the culture. And when I first started watching False Stone, I just noticed how few black dancers were on that program. He had a dance troupe that they called Ballet du Faustin, like, you know, like Faustin's dancers. And for several years, you might see one or two black girls in the cast of dance. I don't know, maybe 25 girls. And it's just like, well, where are the black dancers? You know, um, over the last, I don't know, five, six, seven years or so, they've slowly increased the presence of black women on the program. But as you can see just from this picture here, you don't see many women here that would be classified as black. Um, these girls, some of these girls go on to their own fame. They're as a dance group, they're almost, I don't know that there's, you'll find these type of shows in Brazil where they'll have dancing girls that are bring in the show from a commercial and lead the show to a commercial. And they'll just have these pretty women on the show just to keep the eyeballs on the screen, you know, uh, False Downs dancers are, you know, I don't know, somewhat equivalent to like the Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, you know, something like that. Um, so Juliana Alves, 
became a dancer on this show. She, this, this is a picture of Juliana when she appeared on that show. I don't know how long she stayed on there, but she was a dancer for a while on False Stone. What else can be said about False Stone? Uh, like I said, it wasn't one of my favorite shows or anything, but it's, it's, it was, it's been on, on the air for so long. I don't know, 20, 25, 30 years or so. Um, so let's keep this moving. After, after that, the dancer was contacted by the reality show producers and was confirmed for the third edition of the program. During Big Brother Brazil 3, Juliana received immunity in the second week and was an angel in the third. Let me just keep this moving. She, um, af after her initial success on the country's top reality show, in the fifth week of her participation in, on Big Brother Brazil 3, After that, the dancer was contacted by the reality show producers and was confirmed for the third edition of the program. After her initial success on the country's top reality show, in the fifth week of her participation in Big Brother Brazil 3, Juliana ended up going to the wall and was eliminated with 63% of the public vote after facing the participant who would eventually win that season's edition. So this is Juliana uh, appearing in another novella. I think this is one called this Chi Chi Chi. So her career as an actress, as soon as she left Big Brother Brazil, Juliana was invited to participate in the soap opera Chocolate Con Pimenta, where she played the character Selma. With the end of the program, Juliana was out of work and decided to study psychology at the State University of Rio de Janeiro. Only in 2005 was the actress able to resume her career with the participation in the series Mano a Mano on another network, Hedge TV. In the same year, she also participated in the theater play Como o Diabo Gosta and made a special appearance as the character Sheila in the soap opera Prova de Amor of TV Record, or, you know, Record TV, another television network, one of the top three networks in the, in the country. Her return to global TV happened with an invitation to play a small role in the, mini, in the miniseries Amazonia, playing the role of Aurea. After this role, Juliana was hired by the network and started doing regular work for TV Global. Okay, another picture. Uh, clearly, uh, Juliana Alves is an attractive woman. Um, personal life. Juliana was born in Rio de Janeiro on May 3rd, 1982, the daughter of teacher Fátima Machado and psychologist Sebastião G. Oliveira. The actress started in a theater workshop at the age of 10, and at 18, she became a volunteer and one of the health agents in the Gen... Gincana AIDS Information Project of the NGO Criola, which aims to fight against prejudice against Black women. She graduated in social work at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro and studied dance until she was nominated for the, Baile du, the Ballet du False Down Dance Troupe and started her career at Hedgy Global. Another thing that I'm going to really remember a lot about Juliana Alves, you know, as I said, you, know, you, you just learned she is a trained dancer. Now, I don't even remember, you know, how long has this been? I don't know, 2013, 14, I don't remember. Um, it was all the rage when Beyonce's song, uh, Single Ladies, came out. And it was like everybody was trying to recreate that video. I remember this ridiculous video with uh, Justin Timberlake dressed up like Beyonce with the heels. And I'm like, oh, my God. OK, what's this all about? And. The dance in the video was very, you know, Beyonce has a huge fan base in Brazil. She's, I think she's already announced dates for her new tour for where she's going to be in Brazil. I think she was in Brazil, I don't know, sometime between 2012 and 2014, I think. And, you know, all of her shows sold out, obviously. I just wonder, with $1 equaling five hey eyes, I just, I can't even imagine how much a Beyonce ticket would be in Brazil, like a thousand hey eyes or something. Um, so I remember during that whole craze, Juliana Alves was one of many people who tried to put her own spin. Well, I ain't even going to say her own spin. They all tried to duplicate this video, you know, from beginning to end, you know, Juliana Alves, you know, she did a pretty decent job. You know, it wasn't equal to Beyonce, but you know, they had the same clothing. They had the same lighting, the same background. You know, she pretty did a decent job, a pretty decent job. If you remember, like I said, everybody was trying to recreate Beyonce's video at that time. So that's that's, that's one memory I'm gonna always have about Louis uh, Juliana Alves. So let's get into what this article for the day is talking about. And today's piece, 
Um, this part of the article comes courtesy of the Instituto Luis Gama uh, Instagram page. Um, I've talked about this before. Luis Gama is an important historical figure. There was a film released about him, I want to say two or three years ago about his life. Uh, he was an abolitionist, like in the 19th century. And he was, he studied law, even though he was blocked from going to law school because he was black. I compare him, I've always said Louis Gama to me reminds me of a sort of mixture of like a Frederick Douglass and a Harriet Tubman, Harriet Tubman, because even though he was not given a law degree because he was black, his skill in the courtroom helped him to free, I don't know, somewhere between 300 and 400 slaves. So anyway, this is what this, inst this institute is named after Luis Gama. Okay, this is a picture of him right here. So anyway, um, this is what they discussed a few days ago. And this I says, I have to talk about this. Juliana Alves speaks about the challenges of keeping her child uh, who has light skin and straight hair connected to her ancestry, right? Juliana Alves wants her daughter to have a connection with her ancestry. So the actress Juliana Alves who in the soap opera uh, Amor Perfeito on Brazil's top television network Global plays Wanda, a prominent character in the storyline. She said in an interview with Gama Magazine that she strives going against the social tide so that her five-year-old daughter Yolanda, the child of an interracial union, has a connection with her ancestry. Okay, so this is what the child looked like, you know, a little bit after she was born. Juliana says, I want Yolanda to be proud of her roots of her family on the part of her paternal grandfather who are dark-skinned Black people. I want her to know she's put in situations where they try to whiten her and take away her ancestry just because she has straight hair. Again, this is something that happens in Brazil all the time. When you have, they do this to a person, whether they are brown skin or whether they're light skin or whatever, Brazilians will always try to talk people out of, like, why would you define yourself as Black? And it's all the more successful, the closer the person is to the white phenotype. And as you can see from her daughter right here, I mean, we don't know what she's going to grow up to look like. But from the pictures I've seen of her, it's going to be pretty hard for this girl to take on a black identity. And when, as I said earlier, when a person looks like that, why would you try? You know, she's going to get pushed back from black people now. Um, white people are going to try to, you know, they're going to make sure that she thinks she's white. So it's going to be an uphill struggle to make somebody who looks like her claim black. And I know she didn't necessarily say that she wants her to identify as black, but she does want her to understand her ancestry. Okay, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you do try to insist that this girl is black, it's, it, <laughs> that's kind of a stretch for me. So then she continues um, just, just talking about how Brazilian society wants to whiten people, you know, particularly if you have lighter skin. This happens all the time. My daughter still doesn't understand herself as a menina preta, meaning black girl, because she's very young and is very guided by the issue of color. So she says it here. She says her daughter, I don't know how old the girl is now, maybe five, four, I don't know. She doesn't understand herself as a black girl. And <laughs> when you see other pictures of the girl, they'll be like, well, why, should, why would she? you know, like I said, I don't have a problem. You know, I have lighter skinned people in my own family and, you know, I accept plenty of light skinned black people as being black. But when you have light skin, you know, like the difference between white, you know, European is, uh, people of primarily European ancestry, you compare them to a Japanese person and it's the features that's going to say that even though that Japanese person has fair skin, they're still not white. When you look at a lot of black people with light skin, you can still look in their face and say, OK, I can still tell this person is black. And even if they don't have the light skin or if they do have the light skin, oftentimes the hair texture will signify their African ancestry. Right. But what do you do with light skinned people who, who have straight hair? And then they don't have features that really define them as black. That's why I said I don't it doesn't make sense to me that you're going to throw all mixed race people into the black category. Because to me, it kind of diminishes what, what black is. Um, let me see, where is she? So she, here she's actually talking about not only connecting with her ancestry, but saying she doesn't understand herself as a menina preta, a black girl. So she is talking about, you know, racial classification and identity here. Her racial identity is not so evident because Yolanda's skin is lighter. 
because of my hair, my culture and my family on my father's side, my daughter already understood that she has a black mother. It may seem like a simple thing, but I consider it a step taken. All of her little friends have white mothers. I remember once my hair wasn't braided and she asked me, mom, why doesn't my hair stand up as well? I wish my hair was like yours. Hmm. That's intriguing. <laughs> you know, the, a lot of people of mixed race go through this period where they're doing everything they can to hide that curl, to straighten out the curl so that their hair lays down. So, you know, maybe this girl hasn't been hit with the Eurocentric ideal of beauty that rules over Brazil. And she wants to have her hair that looks like her mother's. Um, what did she say? Yolanda must have been about three years old. A while later, when she was already attending school, she came to comment about a friend of mine who has cabello crespo, meaning kinky curly hair, as being hair of less value. So then she gets into the school and her little school classmates start, you know, pushing on this, uh, this standard of white superiority in terms of beauty. And, you know, now the girl has the idea that, you know, cabello crespo, kinky curly hair is hair of less value. So that's so why I say Juliana Alves has an uphill struggle if she wants to teach this girl to be black. To me, it was evident that she heard some comment that discredited that very hair that she had previously wanted to have. So it was all a job I had to do to show that Crespo or Kinky Curly is also beautiful, which is mommy, mommy's hair. This is proof that anti-racist education is a constant struggle. A black mother paddles against the tide all the time. Well, you're struggling against the tide because of, you know, the partner you chose. You're struggling against the tide because your daughter came out even a little further away from black than you are. Now, you notice in the previous statement up there, I don't know what Juliana uh, Alvis's parents look like. Maybe I'll look for it one day. But she clearly said here that her her paternal grandfather are and it, the, the basically you know the father's side of the family is dark-skinned black people notice here that she didn't mention her mother her mother's racial background and i'm kind of curious about that um if she only mentioned her father maybe you know her mother might be white maybe her mother is you know mixed and so you have this whitening process that i always talk about you know the theory of impedanca cemento where brazilian society wanted every black person in the country to mix after several generations to that brown skin and kinky hair eventually just disappeared into whiteness. So if, if, if you see it as a struggle to implement a black identity with your daughter, you have to consider like, okay, well, you married a white man and had children with him or a daughter, you know, that it is what it is. So um, I want to move on now that you know the story because people in the uh, Instituto Luis Gama Instagram group, they all commented on this. And so I wanted to take a look at what some of the people were saying about what Juliana Alves said, you know, the uphill struggle of trying to teach her child who doesn't necessarily have, you know, clear, visible African ancestry uh, or doesn't have a phenotype that denotes, denotes blackness and how she's dealing with that. So somebody says, this is one of the first comments coming in, says, Anxious for the moment when the black community, dark skin and not dark skin, will recognize each other for the sake of the anti-racist struggle. For now, we are discussing who is black, who is not, and who suffers the most and who suffers the least. As if the suffering were not the result of racism, white people are still winning. So what she's saying here is that, you know, uh, black, you know, it, it's, they're having a struggle in Brazil trying to come to a conclusion about what is black and what is not. And she's saying we need to throw all of this, you know, to the side because white supremacy doesn't end, you know, definitely with black people arguing over who is black and who is not. But with the history of mixing in Brazil, this is a topic that's never going to go away. Another picture of the couple. And this is a more recent picture of the little girl, Yolanda. I don't know. What do you guys think? I think this girl is going to have a hard time def defining herself as black. You know, she's going to get pushback from other black people, you know. The next comment, um, so she says, the next commenter says, I am the result of an interracial union. My mother's family is black and my father is white. And I never fit in as a child being too black to be white and too light to be black. Nowadays, as a 30 year old woman, I recognize myself as a black woman, but my mother and her family do not see me as such. And they say that I have very fair skin and will never suffer the racism they suffer. 
we need to study more about colorism so that we don't have more dark and brown. Let's we'll say more so that we don't have, I'm sure the word here should be moreno, so that we don't have more, you know, black and moreno. Um, let me see here. Yes, to understand that there will be black people of different skin tones. Now, just to speak on this word uh, brown or how it's translated, because it, brown is often translated a lot of ways from different Portuguese terms, such as moreno or mulatto or mestizo, is often translated as brown. So, but, you know, as I said, the way I see it now, that brown category, it, it, it has to come a point where Black Brazilians have to decide that everybody who's mixed does not belong in a Black category. I mean, it makes sense. The next comment says, it would be easier and more coherent for her to teach that her daughter belongs to the Pardu Brown group and has issues that afflict this population and are very different from the issues of Black people. And basically, she's saying it's very simple. And a lot of people say that, you know, and it, if it's true, if this girl should be categorized as Pardu, you know, if people don't see her being clearly black, I can see in a country like Brazil, she could be just, you know, considered part of the white population because a lot of white Brazilians look like her. It's like, OK, they may not pass for white in the United States, but in Brazil, this girl could actually be considered white, even though she's clearly not. OK, another picture of the couple. What do you think about the girl? I don't see this girl classifying herself as black and anybody else saying she is. The next comment says, Pardu is a way for the IBGE to erase our ancestry. Now, the IBGE is the Brazilian Institute of Geography and Statistics. You know, it, you know a lot of, you know, just data that comes out of this, uh, you know, this, this part of the government. My daughter and son are not Pardus because they have fair skin. They're black. Africans in the diaspora. Pessoas pretas de pele clara, meaning light-skinned Black people, and their skin is light, not because of any of their Black ancestors, and that has to be taught. To love our ancestors and their choices, and also to understand the impacts of loneliness and the lack of choice. You all talk like there's no such thing as ethnic rape, and we know the you know, long history of slavery where you know, a lot of the European DNA ended up in you know, Indian and Black women because of uh, you know, often unwanted sexual advances and sexual relations between white men and non-white women. You spend a lot of time fighting pretos de peli clara, again, fair-skinned blacks, and whites who step on you, you leave quiet and safe. Hmm. That's intriguing. She says, you spend a lot of time fighting with light-skinned blacks, but you don't do anything about the white people who, you know, one could say this whole thing is, exists because of, you know, what white people implemented during colonization. Can you imagine the panic of every racist who talks smack to our people on the street? And we oftentimes keep quiet so we don't have to kick the ish out of them. But on Instagram, on Instagram, part of the people, brown mixed people, receive the attention of Afrocentric people as this post proves. And again, the black mother is to blame, just as my mother would be if she fell into the hands of you all here. Next commenter says, despite understanding what you're saying, and I know what that's like, sometimes it seems that the less prejudice she suffers due to phenotype, the more invalid she will be within the Black community and sometimes even hated. It's a very cruel optic. The hateful comments from this post turn my stomach. Without doubt, there are different levels of racism. A Black woman with cabello crespo, again, kinky curly hair, suffers much more racism. The point is, there might be a Black woman with straight hair. This is the case with my mother. Now, that's an intriguing point because I remember years ago when I started reading about the racial situation in Brazil, and there was a saying that says like, well, he's a little bit dark, but he has good hair. It's almost like the hair, it's almost like people can, if you have a certain level of brown skin, it's almost quote unquote forgivable, but they don't want to deal with cabello crespo. If you have a certain you know, kinkiness to your hair, right? You know, so he's saying a, a dark skinned black woman with kinky curly hair is going to experience much more racism than a person who is, you know, a little bit more racially ambiguous, ambiguous, you know, somebody who has straight or loosely curled hair. Okay. I think we all know that. Um, let me see here. Let me skip that comment. Those who don't know their own history have these thoughts. If people don't know Africa, they are like this playing at random. Next comment. 
I hate it too much. Eu sou negro de pele clara, meaning I'm a light-skinned black person. I have cabelo crespo, you know, blondish hair, light eyes, which makes me exotic to the racist eyes. And as much as I understand why light eyes and hair are associated with white people, it bothers me too much. Because these traits that I have inherited from black people in my family, and when I say, when I say they are, wow, blonde blacks with light eyes, but how? If you don't have white DNA, as if it were exclusive to them. Little do they know that sarada exists. Now, sarada is a, <laughs> another one of these terms that you find in Brazil to describe a certain phenotype. And most people that they classify as sarada, they have like um, light skin, sometimes with freckles, and they'll have like, you know, a more, you know, kinky style of hair. Um, I don't know, somebody like Angela Davis could be considered sarada in Brazil, you know, light skin person with freckles, you know, but you, you see like kinky curly hair, you know, there's, <laughs> there's probably hundreds of nicknames people have for different phenotypes in Brazil. Next comment. Um, they think that blonde, brown, straight, wavy hair, light eyes, as well as Christianity, library, philosophy, and other knowledge are their inventions. But they are not ready for this conversation. Early Christianity arose in Africa. St. Augustine was African. So what these people are here are arguing is that if you go back far enough, you'll see that you can find people with dark skin with all different types of phenotypes. You know, um, when you look at the Australian Aborigines, for example, um, when you look people in the Southern Pacific, you find people with brown skin and not necessarily, you know, kinky curly hair. Now, I'm not going to get all into that because I know a lot of studies say, well, these people are not actually uh, genetically connected to Africans. But, you know, that's a whole nother story. But this is the point that they're making, like they're saying, like, well, white people think they have a lock on these phenotypes. Um, but then we know that the black phenotype can come out looking like just about anything. So that's a discussion for another day. Uh, let me see here. Okay, so for the next comment says, for certain Blacks, even when we choose to straighten our hair, we have lost the place of speaking and the racism we suffer does not count. Because you straighten your hair, you'll say you were born with it straight, you know? And that's what was tripped out about Brazil is that there's people in Brazil who can have brown to dark skin and have like really straight hair. But then you have people who have kinky curly hair and then they'll straighten and they say, oh, this is my natural hair. <laughs> so... Listen to the discussion that's going on here. I really enjoy reading some of this, uh, the commentary that goes on on these social networks. Next comment says, this society puts us Blacks in a trying situation all the time. We Black women have to prove something all the time. Next comment. Yes, unfortunately, among other Blacks. Meanwhile, the covenant of whiteness remains firm and strong. So what she's saying there. While black people are bickering and arguing amongst themselves, you know, this is not a problem that you're going to see on the other side of the fence, you know, with the white population. You know, arguably this whole issue with colorism and quote unquote good or bad features, it came out of slavery. You know, this is what they implemented to. And then when you start mixing the people, you have all of these arguments between dark skin and light skin, you know, curly hair, kinky hair, you know, and basically saying, OK, we're all bickering amongst ourselves for our various looks, but yet on the other side, white people are not affected by this. And arguably they're the ones who started this whole thing. Next comment, um, people, there's no challenge at all. The mother is black. The girl also has straighter hair. Her father is white. What's the difficulty in that? Dear, she doesn't have any European traits. Mm. What do you guys think about that? She says, okay, so what she's saying here is the girl, the, what is uh, Juliana Alves is black. Okay, the girl has straighter hair, her father is white, but she doesn't have European traits. Uh, what do you guys think? And she's right. You know, this girl is not going to pass for white in the United States or, you know, Western Europe. But I also don't think people would accept her as black. This is, to me, this is truly a pardo, a parda, a person of mixed race who doesn't fit easily into one category or not, you or the other. This is what I'm talking about now. There are plenty of people in Brazil who are simply, you can't, identify them uh, one race or the other continuing all the little white friends or with white mothers how will it not be difficult to make the child be connected to ancestry is it magic does a person choose to be in the interracial context offer an environment in which all the little friends have a white mother and are probably also white 
and come to talk about paddling against the tide. Ah, speak seriously. Here with my little black boy, there is no tide getting in the way, thanks to Oshala, you know, one of the Odishas that she's referring to here. So what the point she's making here is you're you married a white man. Your daughter is growing up surrounded by, you know, her little white friends and just surrounded by white mothers. You put the girl in this context, but then you're going to complain about paddling against the tide to make her assume her being black or her African ancestry. You know, point here is, OK, if you want your child to have to be conscious of being black and not having a phenotype that might conflict with that, then maybe you should have you should have recreated, you know, with a, a person who looked like you. Case closed. Um, the thing is, the next comment, the thing is, she didn't care about ancestry when it came to picking up the white man. Now she wants to ancestralize her daughter. I mean, in essence, that's everything that I'm seeing here. You know, you're worried about making this girl connect with her African ancestry and being a menina preta, but you chose a white man. That's that's the dice that you choose. So when the numbers fall, you have to accept what you have. This girl probably I mean, you know, she may I've run into plenty of black Brazilians who or people of mixed race who don't have to identify as black because they simply look ambiguous. And I can see, you know, at this age, what this girl looks like, she looks a little bit of both. She looks like I don't see people seeing her as black. I don't see people her seeing her as white. But yet you're going to try to, you know, how come she's not going to identify as black when everything around her? It's like I said, Brazil is like the perfect crime in so many different ways. Um, you find a lot of people who want to put this black identity on their children, but then they didn't create the situation where it would be an easy adaptation of that identity. You know, it's such that you want your children to identify as black, but yet everything around them is white because you have a higher social economic status. You move into neighborhoods, you're going to be surrounded by mostly white people. So like she said, she's paddling up against the tide. Right. But again, if you didn't want to deal with this, that's why you probably should have had children with a black man. So it wouldn't be this issue of how she's going to identify the comment continues. If I were her, I would explain everything to the child and everything would be fine because this confused the child. And in a few years, she will start the discourse that my mother is black, but she'll be <clears throat> totally smeared with privileges. The price of palmitaging is high, my sister. May you continue in peace. Being a good mother is too good. But the first step is an open education and with no makeup. So uh, here we, this word palmitaging comes again, you know, palmitaging again is how mostly uh, black feminists in Brazil came up with a term when they kept seeing so many black men marrying white women. They called it palmitaging. It's like they have predilection to choose white women for long term relationships and just pass over black women. They call it palmitaging. You know, people have argued also that this palmitaging, uh, it affects black women, too. So it's not just one side, even though <clears throat> palmitaging was first used to define black men who seem to just steamroll over black women to get to the white girls. Right. And so she said an open education with no makeup, like, you know, don't try to hide the truth. Right. And, you know, this is another thing, you know, the privileges that a girl is going to have because of what she looks like in comparison to black girls. That's that's just very true, you know. Uh, and she's going to start with the discourse that my mother is black. Yeah, your mother may be black, but looking at the child. I'm, I, sometimes I wonder, you know, you get a lot of situations where black people have these white children. I'm talking about black Brazilians, and I'm sure it happens in the U.S. too, where people ask if the, the child is theirs, because if they look clearly black and then their child doesn't look black, then people get a little bit confused because they don't look like the black parent. You know, have to wonder if this happened to Juliana Alves. Next comment says, I'm mestizo, you know, mixed uh, white father, black mother. Me and my brothers were educated in Europe and we were we we were never recognized by either blacks or whites. Very much a Brazilian story, even though we consider ourselves black, even though we have straight hair or my mother has fair skin. There is a lack of unity among black people. Let's say that again. <laughs> Our race is not united in not even one continent. 
after growing up in Europe, I lived in Brazil and I see a miupi process, especially in Brazil, where blacks within the struggle are segregated. I married a mixed race black woman. I have nephews who don't have any traits because my brothers married Nordic women because we live in Nordic countries. However, we explain the process and the struggle. I feel sad about Brazil with ridiculous expressions like palmitage. We are free to marry whoever we want. Do you think black people think they are more black because they are more or less, they are more or less black? Wait, let me try that again. Do you think people think they are more black because they are more or less dark? Unfortunate. They sound like Aryans from 1942 speaking. Now I want to speak on something that he said, you know, here. It is very true. We are all free to marry who we want to marry and who we think we'll be happy with. My only uh, addendum to that point is you are free to marry who you want to marry, but don't expect that if you and your ancestor continuously marry one group of people and they get further away from the group of color, you know, don't argue about what color they might be. Don't try to force them into the black category. You know, I, the, the 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 little girl that I'm talking about in this in this particular video, I mean, I just you never know what she's going to look like, you know, 20 years from now. But just based on what she looks like now, the girl is a parda. She is clearly a mischiefa. She's going to be in that middle world where black people don't accept her as black and white people don't necessarily accept her as white, even though there are plenty of Brazilians who have that phenotype. And these type of people just they make part of the, the white, you know, the white community. I read about, you know, Brazilians talk about this all, you know, every day, like, you know, our white is not equal to the American white. It's, it's unusual to have very pale skin in Brazil, even being white. So, you know, this idea of Brazilian white, <laughs> you live in, in, in Brazil for like a decade, like I did, and you come back and you see what American white, you remember what American white looks like. And then you remember the Brazilian white that you used to see, and you see a clear difference there. There are I'm going to say there are some very fair skin of Brazilians, but most of the white Brazilians that I've run into, okay, you're white here, but you may not be white in the United States. Anyway, the last comment says people criticizing her for marrying white people as if she lived in apartheid where black people could only marry, date, have children with black people. Sad. So you get a little bit of everything in this, uh, how people felt about Juliana's, uh, wishes to pass on to implement a black identity on a girl who doesn't necessarily look black you know and people have some really choice comments for her like you know you married a white man you produced a child that doesn't really look black doesn't necessarily look white you know let the chips fall where they may you never know how this girl will identify probably just you know just i'm brazilian you know uh i mean what else can be said this is a story that comes up all the time now you know, in the last decade or 15 years where Afro-Brazilian activists are trying to push more mestizos into the Black category. And as I said, depending on how much mix your person has, you could actually still see, you know, person fitting into that Black category. But in a lot of cases, that's just not true. <laughs> They're never going to be accepted as Black because they simply don't look Black enough, right? I don't know. That's, that's kind of how I see it. Anyway, I'm going to end this video here and I'm curious to know what you all thought about this. Do you think, how do you think, what do you think about Juliana, Juliana Alves wanting to implement, make her daughter recognize her African ancestry and maybe even identify as a black girl when she looks like this? I, again, I don't know what the girl's going to look like when she grows up. It's funny. You can actually look at her. You can see a little bit of Juliana, Juliana Alves in her daughter's face. I can see a little bit of that, but just what do you think to me i i would just throw her in the mixed category and call it a day <laughs> it doesn't really look like a black girl to me so anyway with this said i'm going to end the video here curious to know what you all thought definitely uh drop a comment in the comment section you know consider subscribing to this channel if you've watched more than a couple of videos and you got something out of it you know give me a thumbs up you know get a like this video share this video comment on this video Click on that notification bell so that you are one of the first people uh, to receive new videos as I drop them. And with that said, I'm going to wrap this video up and uh, invite you all to come back to the channel for the next video.